to do the dirty work of calling the group together and say, now here's right. Okay. <laughs> no, it's all right. It's okay. I'm still moving through pious desires or pious wishes, Pia Desideria, by Spainer, Philip Jacob Spainer, who is presenting these proposals as a way out, a way to reform the Lutheran Church, which he felt had become Protestant scholasticism. He felt it had become crusted over. And I think you've already, in what I've read, just vignettes from pieces from chapters and, or paragraphs, you can see it's a very ironic book. It's not angry. It's not strident. He's calling Luther the sainted Luther. Uh, he genuinely believes that what he is doing is not just not undoing Luther at all, but adding to Luther. In fact, in German, he would say, Luther has, he gave us das Lehre. He gave us the teaching, the reine Lehre, the right teaching, the best teaching. Uh, what he's adding to that is das Leben, the life. Das Lehre plus da, uh, das Leben. And so it, that's the spirit of this book. Pietism generally is much more irenic than Puritanism. Puritanism knows it's right and zings its points home. Pietism is much more a heart religion, much more even irenic in its apologetics. I think you're getting this. Related to this is a fourth proposal. We must beware how we conduct ourselves in religious controversies with unbelievers and heretics. We must first take pains to strengthen and confirm ourselves, our friends, and other fellow believers in the known truth to protect them from every kind of seduction. Then we must remind ourselves of our duty toward the erring. We owe it to the erring first to pray diligently that the good God might enlighten them with the same light which he blessed us, that he might prepare their hearts for it, having counteracted the dangerous errors, may reinforce what true knowledge of salvation in Christ they still have left in order to be saved as a brand, brand pluck, pluck from the fire. This is the meaning of the first three petitions of the Lord's Prayer, uh, that God may hallow his name in them, bringing his kingdom to them, accomplish his gracious will in them. We must be a good example for them and take the greatest pains not to offend them in any way, for this would give us give them a bad impression of our true teaching and hence would make their conversion difficult. See, the exemplar tradition comes through here. If God has given us the gifts which are needful for it, we must find the opportunity to hope to win the erring. We should be glad to do what we can point out with modest but firm presentation of the truth we profess, profess how this is based sim on the simplicity of Christ's teachings. But beware of invectives. You know, he goes on and talks like this. Now, this really uh, was very different from the sort of strident, argumentative uh, spirit of those who were arguing for right doctrine. This is the love tradition of the Christian rather than the truth tradition. It's not, they ought to be two sides of the same coin. But, folks, since Barnabas and Paul, remember? Barnabas was son of consolation, and he gladly took a flawed disciple named John Mark under his wing. Paul wouldn't have him. Paul could not afford to flawed disciple. He was of the truth tradition. And E. Stanley Jones has a wonderful description of that conflict between Paul and Barnabas in his book, Reconstruction of the Church After Which Pattern, which is a, the whole book's about the Church of Antioch, meditations on the Church of Antioch, including the split between Paul and Barnabas, who were on the same church staff there. And, and this is ironic in that, uh, of course, Barnabas was the only one who would have touched Paul with a 10-foot pole. Uh, Barnabas organized his whole ministry around losers. Um, there is a loser tradition in a Christian 
church, and that's pietism uh, also. And so you don't go out and try to argue people into the ground. Militant apologetics is not the way it's done. You go out and try to love people. Love them, those who err. And whatever you do, don't, don't become so offensive that the people never get a chance to be offended by Christ. Kind of rule of thumb, you know. That is a quote from Paul Little. Uh, it, he gave that to me once in a class. Uh, let's see. We should. In, so he goes on to say, we should, in the fourth place. Wait a minute. Yeah. Okay. Fourth. To. Did you summarize this third one? Yeah. This was the fourth. I'm sorry. Um, what he's saying about this then is that we should practice heartfelt love toward all believers, unbelievers, and heretics. We should be a Samaritan to them, etc. In the fifth place, if there is any prospect of a union of most of the confessions among Christians, the primary way of achieving it, the one that God would bless most, and perhaps be this, that we do not stake everything on argumentation for the present disposition of men's minds, which are filled as much by fleshly as spiritual zeal, and makes uh, this fruitfulness uh, uh, unfruitful. He said, therefore, I hold that not all disp disputation is useful and good. What our sainted Luther hold, said holds at times, truth, quote, truth is lost not by teaching, but by disputing. For disputations bring with them this evil that men's souls are, as it were profaned, and when they are occupied with quarrels, they neglect what is most important. So he goes on to talk about disputants. Well, man, that was zinging right to the heart of Lutherans, because they had had quarrels over everything. They, that's the whole way they would deal with doctrine, would have a public quarrel about it. And if, if you could run a knife through somebody else and destroy their argument, that was the way the Lutheran Church was arriving at truth. Um, so he, he goes on to, uh, to grapple with that. Now, you know what I think I've done? I've given you the fifth. That was a sub-point under the fourth. I'm sorry. Having to do with the attitude toward unbelievers and so on. The fifth. It is of the utmost importance... Oh, let me read the first part of the sentence. Since ministers must bear the greatest burden. Now, if the fire hasn't hit the fan by this time, it really got under their craw in this one. Since ministers must bear the greatest burden in all these things which pertain to a reform of the church. And since their shortcomings do correspondingly great harm, it is of the utmost importance that the office of the ministry be occupied by men who, above all, are themselves true Christians, <laughs> and then, having the divine wisdom to guide others carefully on the way of the Lord. It is therefore important, indeed necessary, for the reform of the church that only such persons be called who may be suited, and that nothing all except the glory of God be kept in view during the whole procedure of calling. If how such persons are to be called to the ministry, they must be available. Hence, they must be trained in our schools and universities. May God graciously grant that everything thereto, thereunto may be diligently observed by professors of theology, that they may assist in seeing that the unchristian academic life which prevails among our students and faculties and have been sorrowfully lamented um, be suppressed and reformed. Schools ought to be recognized from the outward life of students to be nurseries of the church, estates and workshops of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting? A school should be a nursery of the church, an estate or workshop of the Spirit, rather than places of worldliness and indeed the devils of ambition, tippling, carousing, and brawling, which Apparently, they had it theological faculties. Professors, therefore, should exercise good discipline among those who eat at the table, not permit mischief and gain. Edifying conversation should be carried on, unseemly talk, especially talk in which texts of the Bible, parts of hymns, and similar words are misused by twisting their meaning to evil purposes, etc., etc. Um, 
so he, he goes on and makes this point that academic preparation cannot just be with exams and knowledge. In fact, here's the sort of heart of his fifth point. It would be especially helpful if the professors would pay attention to the life as well as the studies of the students entrusted to them and from time to time speak to those who need to be spoken to. Professors should not act in a way, uh, you know, to, you know, they should openly and ex expressly show those who lead a godly life, even if they're behind the others in their studies, how dear they are to their teachers and how very much they are to be pre preferred above the others. You should prefer the godly students to the academically uh, up front. In fact, these are the students the only ones who ought to be promoted, who ought to be passed. It would not be a bad thing if all students were required to bring from their universities testimonials concerning their piety as well as their diligence and skill. Uh, in my seminary, we now have uh, assessment teams, and it's very interesting. Uh, with assessment one, which is a sort of whole battery of personality tests. Assessment two, in which three or four of us, depends, I've been on this team quite a number of years, sit down and question students about their, every aspect of their lives, you know, personal, family, spiritual, economic, everything else. And we've literally um, dropped some people from school at the mid-course assessment. Um, we also reserve the right to require special counseling services and other things for them. This is a whole new thing. What we found is that so many of our students were so academically burned out when they got done with the curriculum, they went out and burned out churches. And, um, or that they passed exams beautifully, but that they were bitter and in debt and uh, fighting with their wife. Uh, not unreasonable to fight with your wife in seminary because you're living usually in cramped quarters, uh, studying all night, and well, surely you know what that's like. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, we, it's interesting how uh, even today we struggle with this kind of an issue. When I went to Trinity, you know, nobody gave a rip about me uh, as a person. Um, I was a number in a big class, you know, you sort of pass your exams, and if you get through the graduation line, you somehow are fit for ministry. Um, but I think we're taking more and more uh, a different view. Now, if a seminary gets too large, it makes it very difficult to do this. It's very labor-intensive stuff. But I, I know the issues that you're struggling with here because they still persist. Uh, what is leadership? You know, How important is the heart and faith as well as uh, an articulated doctrine and vision and skill and preaching even? The ability to turn on an audience may or may not be ultimately the most qualifying uh, factor. Well, you can imagine if there were ministers who were not upset by the time they got to point five, they were upset by now. <laughs> Our dear Luther expressed this opinion, and he documents it, of course, gives the location where you can find it. A man becomes a theologian not by comprehending, reading, or speculating, but by living and indeed dying and being damned. So he, again, he saw his whole <coughs> life as retrieving a Luther that had been set aside, retrieving a Luther that, that uh, Germany 100 years later, 150 years later, had forgotten about. Six, in addition to these exercises, which are intended to develop the Christian life of the students, it would be also helpful if teachers made provision for practice in those things with which the students will have to deal when they are in ministry. For example, there should be practice at times in instructing the ignorant, in comforting the sick, especially in preaching where it should be pointed out to students that everything in the sermon should be edif have edification as the goal. I therefore add this as a sixth proposal whereby the Christian church may be helped to a better condition that sermons be prepared by all that their purpose, faith, and fruits may be achieved to the hearer's greatest possible degree. You design your 
sermon then for the benefit of the hearer, not because you want to wow them with your knowledge about a text, um, which was happening in, um, in, at that particular time. I read, and I couldn't put my finger on it, one of the great, one of the great parody sermons of, of this time that was actually preached and written in a commentary was a sermon, a, a stem-winding sermon on the hairs of your head are numbered. And it was a discourse on the care and, uh, of your hair and, you know, on the care and feeding and the numbering of your hair. And then it would go off into, you know, speculation about all the knowledge that God has of which this is but one part. And, you know, it was, it was just unbelievable that people actually, peasants, would go to church and hear a sermon like that. It, had, it would go on and on and on and on, and on uh, you know, about the knowledge of God. And it was all on this, you know, sort of a takeoff on this, uh, te well, have, have you heard sermons like that? I have heard sermons like that. Man, I've heard sermons like that. Yes. Oh, oh, I see. Those who used to have waves who now have beach. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Well, in conclusion, I, ferv I call fervently on the gracious God and giver, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, you know, he, he closes with a prayer. He admonishes people not to jump to hasty conclusions. May many preachers be revived by this to preach. And he dates at uh, Frankfurt on Main, uh, March 24, 1675. Philip Jacob Spainer, Th.D., pastor and senior of the ministerium in Frankfurt. Well, this created quite a stir. The Lutheran establishment was just really blown away by this, but the lay people loved it. And they went after their pastors. Uh, they got involved in Bible studies. And out of this movement came an extraordinary energy, the Bible study intermission movement, uh, restoring of spiritual priesthoods, and women got involved. And, and Spener then was joined by a partner called Franca, F-R-A-N-C-K-E. Franca, who died in uh, 1727, um, was in Holly and had uh, an incredible establishment of mis ministries, and Halle, H-A-L-L-E, -L -L -E, became the pietist headquarters of Germany. And people came to Halle to study pietism like they had come to Geneva to study Calvinism. Halle set out a stream of people and documents, literature, missionaries, and they went all over Scandinavia. My uh, father's hero, Hans Nielsen Hauge, was a lay preacher who was influenced by Holly, went all over Norway preaching the gospel and preaching pietism, preaching these sort of six points and things like this. Um, tomorrow I'll talk, be talking about the First Great Awakening in the U.S. It began in Manhattan. It, it began in New York, which was then New Amsterdam, in the parish of Theodore Frelinghuysen in 1526, one year before Frankie died. Frelinghuysen, a Dutch domine in New York, when it was New Amsterdam, was so enthused about this, he began doing parish visitation to begin to love the people. And that spark, uh, no pastors did that. They stayed in their studies, went to the sanctuaries, delivered their sermons, showed up at funerals and weddings, and spent their time in universities and reading and writing manuscripts. And uh, he got so excited about the word and the visits and prayer and all these that he went out and organized all this stuff in his parish in 1726 and it caught on like wildfire in a Calvinist parish. The Great Awakening was born in a Dutch Calvinist parish. I think that's very interesting. And it was influenced from this German pietist stuff. Pietism, therefore, was an ecumenical movement. It spread across denominational lines. Uh, people read pietist literature and many different traditions, Anglicans. Uh, and of course, I'll tell you in a few minutes that uh, Wesley, who had gone to Georgia to be a missionary and failed tremendously, came back as a spiritual burnout, a washout missionary, and he realized he needed help, and you know what he did? 
He went to Germany. Uh, he was fluent in German. Uh, he went and spent some time with Zinzendorf at Herrenhut, the Pietist Life Community Center, and uh, read John Arndt's book, True Spirituality, and all of these things, and came back as a flame. Um, so Pietism influenced Anglicanism. It influenced uh, Dutch Calvinism, Norwegian Lutheranism, all these things. Uh, pietism was an ecumenical movement. Now, John McNeil has what I think is a very helpful little description. I hope you don't mind reading my reading things to you from time to time, but I just didn't have time to go out and print documents and mimeograph stuff, which I could have given you. But some rather cryptic differences between Puritanism and Pietism. And I think these are very instructive. While some of you were out of the room, I suggested that while Continental Lutheranism flowed into Pietism, Continental Calvinism produced the Anglo-Puritan tradition. And it's not an accident that we're talking about two very different kinds of reform. Puritanism is reform really from the top down. Puritanism brings about reformation by educating the clergy. Pietism brings about reformation by educating the laity. It's a bottom-up model. Small groups. I'll probably argue later that evangelicalism tries to do both and doesn't do either well all the time. Okay. Um, Ernst Trelsch and a number of others who've written on Puritanism and Pietism uh, have made some observations, and McNeil has collected some of these. Pietism, he thinks, was more individualistic and subjective than Puritanism. Pietism was emotional, while Puritanism was more solid, austere, and in a sense, intellectual. Pietism emphasized love and joy. Puritanism emphasized faith and works and became somber. Pietism arose as a reaction against formalism. Puritanism as a reaction against Romanism and immorality. I think that's interesting. The origins determine their tone, shape, content. Puritanism was a reaction against the Romishness of Anglicanism. And it didn't reject everything about Anglicanism but it rejected the Romish excesses of Anglicanism, whereas pietism uh, is incubated in the context of formalized Lutheranism. It didn't reject much of the Lutheran doctrine, but the formalization of the spiritual life. <clears throat> it must be said that in the course of his argument, these generalizations are considered to be modified. It is rather obvious they require some correction. The Puritans also denounced formalism, while, greater, while the greater pietists were adamant against papacy. And nobody could be more insistent on good works than Franca. While Spainer taught heart religion and gave recognition to emotion, there were likewise some Puritans who cultivated an intense religious emotion. So they were all alike, he says. I mean, he thinks Trouch has overstated his case. Uh, McNeil does. He thinks that Trausch has sort of put them in boxes that aren't quite true. I think there are some generalizations there that probably are partially true, but you always have to be careful when you generalize. They're generally wrong, you know? Generalizations are generally wrong. We, we use them as a kind of working hypothesis, but you have to be careful with them. They were certainly alike in their emphasis upon disciplined life and demand for practical training for ministers. Like Puritanism, pietism was intellectual, at least for, for the sense of possessing a concern for education and training of the mind. Some pietists were men of distinguished learning. The movement gave 
indeed an impulse to popular education in Germany comparable to that of Puritanism and nonconformity in, in England. But the differences are real and notable, however. And now you can take McNeil down. One difference lies in the attitude to worship. Resemblance of pietism to Puritanism here are <coughs> accidental. The Puritans were in revolt against a formal liturgy cluttered with medieval accretions. But Spener had far more to say in criticism of preaching than of worship. And his modifications of worship were slight. I think that's really important. Uh, one of the great legacies of pietism today is Anglican, low church Anglicanism. And here's pietism with the prayer book and with the chorale and with robes and smells and bells. It's not, I mean, there is a pietism today that is quite comfortable with, um, with formalism, but Puritanism is just, you know, sing a hymn, have a sermon, have a prayer, take an offering, go home kind of thing. You know, very simple, very, very simple worship. It's mostly with the center pulpit and all of that. Um, I can see the difference in puritanical worship as opposed to pietist worship. Second difference. Another difference is that while Puritans took to politics like ducks to water, the pietists, following an early personal decision of Spener, avoided political issues. I can see this played out in different branches of evangelicalism, some of which are highly political and some of which just, you know, avoid it like the plague until abortion or some issue gets their craw and then they jump in, guns blazing, shoot themselves as much as the enemy. <laughs> they really don't know what, you know, don't know what the politics is. It's us, you know, we've met the enemy and he's us and they go <laughs> looking for somebody to fight and wound their own self. Okay, the, the Lutheran acceptance of the political society as a given and to be endured was not, a challenge, was not challenged by Spener. And no doubt the environment offered discouragement to voluntary political effort. Despite pietism's avoidance of politics, Dr. Pinson has discovered in it the sources of 19th century German nationalism. His evidence, however, is not very convincing. I want to tell you this is a critical issue. If pietists are culpable in the Prussianization of Germany, then pietists are culpable in the rise of Hitler in World War II and World War I. And that's a pretty heavy burden to bear. And pietism has been accused of um, opening the door for the Enlightenment in Germany. And you know how they did it? According to, say, um, Missouri Synod Lutherans, who are anti-pietist. Uh, they're the most hardline of the Lutherans on the creed tradition. And what they said was, when pietism came along and started putting more emphasis on the heart than the head, they opened the door for subjectivity. And German enlightenment set up house in subjectivity and enlightenment led was a fruit of pietism. And that the confessional tradition of right doctrine was wiped away by 19th century rationalism in the universities and that the pietists had opened the door with their key of subjectivity and heart religion. And so the German uh, Missouri Synod inerrantist people, I mean, it's very interesting to see people fighting inerrancy for different reasons in this country, fighting for it. The Missouri Synod is one of the great fighters for the sort of creedal, confessional approach to theology. They do not trust spirits. I mean, they follow one piece of Luther. Luther said to, about Thomas Mincer, <laughs> this is Luther now. This is the Luther who thought that the highest, you, the best thing you could do as a Christian would be to fart in the devil's nostrils. I mean, that's how he talked, of course. <laughs> you know, it's, Luther, Luther said of Mincer, who was trying to, who claimed to be very spiritual, he said, 
Munzer, I wouldn't believe him if he swallowed the Holy Ghost, feathers and all. <laughs> I mean, Luther just did not have a high regard for spirits. In fact, Luther said, I can't tell spirit movement from bowel movement. I can't tell the difference. <laughs> if I don't have an objective scripture, he said, to correct my spirit, I don't know how to move in the world. I mean, you know, that's how Luther talked. <laughs> I think you might like this guy if you were, <laughs> if, if we weren't so offended by him. I mean, L Luther, Luther was so great fun. Uh, but you know, <clears throat> I mean, just so so unlike a Puritan, so uncouth, you know, right? <laughs> it was it was German. It was peasantry, and it, it came through this brilliance of of Luther and, and but the zest, you know, and like always had fun at parties, you know, as I said. Uh, but, but here, um, like I'm saying, even Luther has been blamed for Nazism, partly because he said evil things about uh, Jews, which was true, and partly because he was a German nationalist. Now, so the next paragraph or two that I'm going to read is pretty important because um, it, it's a historical question a live historical question. What produced the Germany of World War I, World War II? Especially since it was the birthplace of the Reformation. Is, can you see the issue? You gotta think about that. Um, so, Dr. Pinson has discovered that, um, though not convincingly, according to the Englishman John McNeil, so you have to understand that he's going to present a point of view that he's not necessarily comfortable with. You can critique it. His evidence is not very convincing. In this connection, the importance he would have us give to the use by the pietists and later by the leaders of the national movement of certain key words seems not to be justified. It is doubtless true that pietists talk a great deal about vita gebert, which is new birth, new birth. And that Fichte employed this word with reference to the German nation, giving birth to the new German people. But it is unsafe to argue from such data that pietism was the matrix of German nationalism. There is nothing to prevent a political party from helping itself to the vocabulary of religion. In fact, it's done all the time. The, national, the Italian National Resurrection Party was not dependent on a um, risorgimento resurrection was not depend on any religious movement. Even the pietist promotion of the educational use of the German language was not for nationalistic purposes. It was so people would understand the Bible. See? It was a means of securing the readier spread of knowledge. So pietism went out and founded schools that used German instead of Latin because they wanted people to read the Bible in their own language. But later on, then, you see this gets, say, well, see, without German, uh, we wouldn't have had the Germanic nation. And the Germanic nation leads to, you know, Nazism. Now, there is a, there is a historical um, phrase that Otto von Ranke, great German historian, who is a great historiographer, a great study, stu historiography is the study of the students of history. It's this, it's, it's, if you've ever had a course, in, I majored in history in college, and you know, your final seminar, at least in my school, was a historiographic seminar where you sat around and you interpreted, and you saw the, all the different ways people are interpreting history. Because it's not a lab science, it's like psychology. You're, a Rogerian approaches, you know, an Eric Erickson or something has a different way of looking at the data. So in that, um, Von Ranke has a phrase, viest eigenlich gewesen ist, as it actually happened. And we, you have to look at that and people say, aha, so this is as it actually happened. And on that basis, you sort of build a chronology and say, you know, therefore Luther, therefore this, therefore that, therefore this, aha, see, Luther, culpable. But you've got to remember another phrase of Von Ranke, uh, post hoc ergo propter hoc, that is, just because it was after this, doesn't mean it was account of this, <laughs> on account of this. And so sometimes history gets a little tricky. I can probably prove that every one of you who is an alcoholic 
if there is such a person in this room, began on milk. <laughs> and that milk, if you had not drunk milk, you probably wouldn't have eventually gotten to alcohol. Right? I think, you see. <laughs> That's Fiesta Eigenlichkeitsness, as it actually happened. But just because everybody who began on breast or bottled milk, if you turn out to be an alcoholic, you cannot blame that on milk, I think. See, that's, that's a, a phony way of looking at the history. So history isn't just a, a chronology of the past. It's, you've got to have some distinctive criteria for looking at this. And I, I hope that um, you're being... Uh, aware that even in my presentation I'm trying to be balanced in some of that, although not totally. I suppose some of my Baptist uh, urbanity is coming through. Um, why not? <laughs> <laughs> you, you can go to some other history class if you want to get rural uh, theology from Presbyterians. <laughs> go to Princeton or someplace. Okay. Um, Admittedly, it is more true, let's see, even the pietist promotion of education in the German language, okay, I got that. Admittedly, it is also true that any movement in religion that stirs a whole nation, even though controversies may attend it, helps to unify the nation's culture. Pietism did stir the, the German people. So to speak, it awakened them out of a moral sleep. But on the other hand, Germany had seen no movement more ecumenical in spirit than pietism, more aware of the whole world and concerned with issues of worldwide Christianity. If it inadvertently, in some degree, aided later nationalism, it deliberately and zealously inculcated an interest in the church's far-flung fellowship and task. Pietism remained a distinctive factor in German life with many manifestations to the days of Schleiermacher, Jung, and Stilling and others. It passed to Denmark, Sweden, and Norway and was infused into the rising Lutheranism of America. It was influential in Switzerland. It stimulated the Methodists and Evangelicals in England, and the founders of the British Mission Societies. It reached out to the New England Congregationalism and the Reformed Churches of Germany, Holland, and America. Whether it is any sense a revival of a pre-Protestant uh, piety or not, it has added something to Protestantism, something without which Protestantism would be vastly poor. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. And so there are some differences between Puritanism and Pietism. And I think evangelicals are sort of on a continuum. Some more Pietist, some more Puritan. I think uh, my Lutheran origins, which then took me to Moody, tried to wring some of my pietism out of me and make me more Puritan. Then I went back to Seattle Pacific and got a little more pietist than Puritan. Back to Trinity, tried to make me more Puritan again. And then to McCormick and I became more pietist again. I, th I think I, I'm just playing with my own map at this point, but I think uh, how it'd be, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how you map your own journey here through the minefield or through the uh, magnetic field, the maze of Puritan versus Pietist. I have a feeling that Navigators is more uh, Pietist in form and Puritan in content. Maybe. Maybe. Um, and I think I could make uh, an argument for that distinction. Well, um, just unbelievable um, influence. Now I want to shift to England again and the Wesleyan movement and basically go uh, on this and Anglican evangelicalism and other evangelicalism for the rest of the day. Uh, do, do you have any objections to that? Are you ready? to make a little shift? <laughs> because in, in these movements, um, huh? We're the blind, you're the guide. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you, want, you might want to, uh, to talk about Immanuel Kant or um, Leibniz or Beethoven. 
or some other people who lived at this time. Would you talk sometime about Kant? Some, you know, maybe the word right the, now. The second Emmanuel. Really Emmanuel Kant, yes. Kant, uh, Kant is really the ultimate. Oh, let me say something about the age of reason. Um, In, um, in France, the age of reason led to unbelievable cynicism. Um, people began to just poke, use reason and, and empirical methods to just, you know, blow away the evidences for the gospel and evidence for faith. An exception was an early exception was Blaise Pascal the greatest of the French users of reason. There was also a Puritan French Catholic tradition called Jansenism. I didn't mention it, but it was a kind of, there was a French Puritanism which was not happy with the, and, and sought to de-Romanize, in a sense, the Roman Catholic Church. It was Cornelius Jansen who founded it rediscovered Augustinianism and tried to get sin back into the vocabulary of the French salvation and grace. That was an important method in France, and, but that was all being swept away by the cynics. And, you know, I, you read Diderot, D-I-D-E-R-O-T, and the existentialists of France, and you I, I read a story there in Diderot that sort of epitomizes what happened to the French age of reason. Two men are walking through a jungle and they can hardly see. They have a flickering candle and they're struggling to see the shadows in the limited light of the candle. And my friend said, if you blow out the candle, we will see better pause, my friend is a theologian. Do you get it? You know, I mean, I'm just struggling to hold on to a little bit of light of truth in the Bible. And the very guy who turns out and tells me I should blow it out is, is the theologian. That, that sort of says where the French were. And of course, the French age of reason was answered by revolution. Revolution is, and tyranny of revolution was the response of the French people to the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment in Germany and England took a very different turn. It was much more literary, much more philosophical. David Hume wrote his book on miracles. And David Hume died in uh, 17... In, uh, 1776, I believe, so, right about the time of the American Revolution. And David Hume wrote an essay against miracles. And he just, um, you know, by, by this time, the sort of passive anti-miraculousness of Tyndall and, and um, Tolan, miracles unnecessary, he was arguing miracles don't happen. I mean, look around you. How many resurrections have you ever seen? Empirically, let's go out and let us canvas the whole city and guess what? Let's sit in cemeteries. You take this one, I'll take this one, I'll take this one. Let's sit there 50 years. Let's chart and graph it. Let's bring the data together. How many miracles of resurrection will we see? Answer? None. Here's the logic of David Hume. Uh, uh, miracles don't happen, ergo, or therefore, they didn't happen. Ergo, they won't happen. End of faith. And Hume was so skeptical by this time that he left philosophy and started writing mediocre history books um, and died in somewhat despair. Then came Immanuel Kant, and I called him the second Immanuel because if you're a, philosoph if you're a history of philosophy, a student, you know that he, his is the high watermark of philosophical opposition to uh, 
uh, ontological arguments for the existence of God, for philosophical proofs of resurrection and all of that. Immanuel Kant, Immanuel Kant um, just basically dusted off the spot where Hume stood with uh, his arguments. Basically something like this. Every person is born not a blank slate, as Locke had said, but with a mixture of subjectivity and objectivity in their mind. And no one is objective, and there is no way to look at a truth with pure objectivity. Truth is always a mixture of, of object and us. Object and us. And you can see what that does. It means um, that no one really sees all truth or even any truth. We all sort of see partial truth. Taken to its logical order then, no absolute truth could exist, including absolute biblical truth. Building on Lessing, who has this famous what he calls ditch, Lessing's ditch, Lessing's ditch is this statement. The accidental truths of history, like resurrections, the accidental truths of history can never become the proofs of philosophy. And so the combination of Lessing and uh, Kant was just devastating to the Christian faith. Immanuel Kant wrote a critique of pure reason. The German then final response to the Enlightenment was not a revolution. It was, it was a book which said there is no such thing as enlightenment, basically. There's no such thing as pure reason. There is no pure reason. <laughs> and it not only left reason in shambles, it left uh, biblical arguments based on reason in shambles. Empirical evidence for the resurrection is accidental proofs of history can't be proofs of philosophy, it's just your argument, it's okay, so everything is relative. Pietism was German's response to Kant. After Kant wrote the book Critique of Pure Reason, he wrote another book in which he turns inward and begins to psychologize all reality. It was a book about morality. He was followed by, um, uh, and I need to say a little bit about the German higher critical school. Higher criticism began <coughs> with the pietists. Johann Albert Bengel the greatest of the biblical scholars of the 18th century. He was a Tübingen scholar, but he was translating Hebrew, Greek, and Latin as a grade school kid in Schondorf. I've seen some of the stuff he wrote. It's still displayed there in the museum of the Schondorf church just outside Stuttgart, where a dear friend of mine has been pastor for years. And, and I mean, this is an unbelievable reality that the man who invented higher criticism is is uh, the Lutheran pietist Bengel. Um, Bengel went to Tübingen and he began to study the Bible with such devotion that he understood that there's no way that it could contradict evidence. Uh, and, um, and so he taught the students to read the Bible in context and use any linguistic methods, any historical methods, any arguments from reason. He, he didn't his faith led him to believe that that could in no way ever endanger biblical study. It would be a friend to it. It would help us because, as he might argue, the, there's no way the God of the world can contradict the God of the Word. So, so you go full bore, damn the torpedoes, right into the use of reason to understand Scripture. And, and of course, the opening generation of higher criticism in Tübingen was guided by a devotional reverence for the Word of God. But within a generation it became more and more skeptical, <coughs> particularly when the anti-miraculous philosophy began to come through. 
And in 1835, David Strauss wrote a book called Das Leben Jesu, The Life of Jesus, in which he was just devastatingly anti-miraculous. Graf and Wellhausen did a real number on Moses. Uh, he didn't exist. He was the figment of the imagination. And really behind him was there were four biblical authors, J, E, D, and P. And with a kind of scissors and paste method, they went at the Pentateuch. And, and it was based on a Hegelian understanding that the earliest part of the Bible had to be the most primitive. And so what you do is you bring to that basic assumption that whenever you find a primitive idea in the Bible, you put it early. And wherever you find uh, an advanced idea, you put it late. Why? Because we all know Darwin was right. The world's getting more and more smart. It's evolving from the simple to the complex. So you take this sort of unilinear Hegelianism, which was emerging, and you apply it to the Bible. And you're just stunned to find that there's some things in Genesis that have a lofty view of God and some things in later Old Testament that have a pretty lousy view of God and sort of ignorance. So what you do is you rearrange it. You rearrange it according to the understandings of the 19th century. And unfortunately, <coughs> higher criticism, I would say, is not wrong, but the presuppositions of the higher critics were. Uh, I don't think there's any way in which honest biblical scholarship can hurt any of us. But this was not honest because when they were coming at the Bible, they were coming with biases of anti-miraculous. They were coming with certain kinds of Darwinianism, very much uh, German <coughs> rationalism. And they were applying that kind of skepticism to the text itself. There were biases that were just unbelievable. It's interesting how that stuff gets, still gets taught in some schools. Um, but um, now pretty much, you see, archaeology has really wiped out some of that stuff because archaeology has pointed out that I, re I remember an argument in class um, where <laughs> you remember Jacob and the wells and the camels story in Genesis? And Isaac, uh, the bride for Isaac, they're riding a camel over there to get a bride. Well. Abraham was said to have lived around 2000 BC, and nobody could figure out how he could have domesticated a camel that early. And I remember being in a class where um, a person was arguing with Albright's uh, philosophy. Uh, Albright shocked the world by proving that camel domestication had occurred at least as early as 2250 BC, 200 before, years before Abraham. So it was no problem. And, and the whole higher critical theory was that camel domestication had come much later. So therefore, the Sarah story couldn't be right. It had to be somebody later on writing the story and putting it in a past time, see? Archaeology has just blown away most of that stuff. Uh, the Egyptianism and hieroglyphics and all of that stuff. So much of the 19th century suspicions have been destroyed. But it's still around. Every person, you remember the quadrilateral? We all bring bias to that thing. And, and uh, that's why I say I, I work between these four poles. I want to be subject to scripture, but I also read the scripture from my own sort of rural Lutheran pilgrimage map background, as you read it differently from me, from your background. And of course, your context is a little different as mine is. And I've shared with you, you know, uh, Moses' mother floating her kid down the river kind of approach the book of Exodus begins with women who break the law, right? The liberation of God begins with women who break the law. It's clear as can be in Exodus that that's how the book of Exodus begins. God begins his liberation movement by women who break the law. It's civil disobedience because it's an unjust law. Have you ever heard a sermon on that? But if you pastored women who are on a public aid culture, who are struggling with that issue, of course, you'd see it. You'd see it. So as I'm trying to point out, I'm reading the Bible from my context. I'm forced to grapple with stuff that's there in the Bible. I would just, we filter it. We just don't, don't get our heads at it. So I would agree in a way with Kant that there is. What Kant doesn't have is the Holy Spirit. And that's the check and balance to subjectivity for me. It's the spirit and the word 
mix. The, the balance of spirit and word is for me the, the check on error. Um, and the, of course, our biases and our presuppositions are, are critically important. Um, so the um, age of reason was answered in several <coughs> ways. One, by reasoned apologetics. Two, by revolution, in France especially. And three, by revival in England. And to that, we'll turn after lunch. Mm -hmm. uh, just a, a short question. On, in Germany, it seems like <clears throat> that Luther sort of developed his theology. And I get the impression that um, the Lutheran theology sort of stopped with Luther. He developed a certain amount of it to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. And then it just uh, seems to stop and halt there. Mm -hmm. And it's not tampered with too much after that. That, yes, we right? yes we do not say the Luther Church. We say the Lutheran Church, and most everybody believes that the Lutheran Church today is more Melanchthonian than Lutheran at some levels. Because between the death of Luther, even before Luther died, there were five major congresses, con uh, controversies, disputations, in which points that were ambiguous in Luther were argued from the antinomian idea, which uh, was one, and there were several others dealing with um, real presence at the supper and so on. And finally, in 1577, the formula of Concord standardized Lutheranism. Luther had been dead 31 years. Three years later, and, and that was the work of a guy named David Catreus, basically. And then, and then the creeds were brought together in 1580 Lutheranism standardized with the publication of what was called the Book of Concord. And that book became the Bible for Lutherans. It was the creed framework through which they would now read the Bible from then on. That's right. And so there was a kind of closure to the canon of Luther. Uh, Lutherans have struggled with a love-hate relationship to that creed tradition ever since. The pietism, you see, was a way, was saying the Book of Concord had crusted over, and it keeps us from getting at the real Luther. We got to get back behind Concord. Concord is never mentioned, to my knowledge, in, in uh, Spainer. I, I don't recall ever seeing it. But, but what he is doing is digging around behind Concord to get back to the Luther of the, the early Luther. By the way, another um, thing that happened, of course, in the 19th century was Karl Marx. Um, Marx was not new. He borrowed Hegel. Now, Hegel, writing about the time that Beethoven was buying or writing his Eroica, and this, you're talking about the first quarter of the 19th century, 1820, uh, Hegel Hegel said, every thesis in history has its antithesis. And then there's this conflict out of which comes the new synthesis. And you wed this to the doctrine of progress. Here's the thesis. Here's the antithesis. You get a new thesis, a new antithesis, a new thesis, a new antithesis. But what you don't see is that it's a uniliteral doctrine of uh, progress. Now, if I believe Hegel, let's read the New Testament, okay? I got Jesus and the Jesus Church thesis. And then I come to Paul, and I realize here's the counter. Paul, the Paul Church is very different from the Jesus Church. So Luke is written to integrate the two and it kicks us up a notch to the new synthesis. So what I have to do is read, if I'm a Hegelian and read the New Testament, I read Jesus as counter to Paul, or Paul as the counter to Jesus. And Luke, the first 15 chapters is Petrine, the last 14 chapters or 13 chapters are Pauline. And Luke is the theologian who, who does a, a 
a sort of conflict management job on the early church. He's the one that sort of <laughs> brings the two together and creates the whole new thing and integrates it from then on out. Now, that's how Hegelian <clears throat> thinking was influencing Bible study. That was a sort of contextualization of um, 19th century biblical hermeneutics. They, they were studying these things. Darwinism, you know, uh, had all sorts of counterparts. Uh, psychology was born. And people began to do more of an analysis on personal faith. It became much more important how you believe than what you believe ultimately, and, and subjectivity. This came through in Schnelling, who was the great mentor of Paul Tillich. Uh, Schnelling's work was the first in which the, the, the gefühl, the, the feeling tradition, well, not the first, Schleiermacher was the first. Schleiermacher really had sort of psychologized the Christian faith. I mean, <laughs> person preaching, repent, you're going to hell. And Schleiermacher would, uh, I'm sorry you feel that way. Why are you so angry? <laughs> you know, and you stand there, you want to talk about hell, and the person who's listening to you is analyzing, why are you so angry that you have to preach on hell? See? <laughs> and and that, that's the kind of shift that was taking place in the 19th century in Germany. And it impacted the kind of, of, of uh, Bible study that was being done in higher criticism. I am not a, f uh, a foe of higher criticism per se, only the biases that control it. I really have a high degree of faith in the scripture. It's, it, it'll take care of itself. And if, if somebody comes out and says, you know, they have this view and no longer is it possible to believe something, don't believe that. I mean, you got, you know, for 2,000 years people have been saying that. I just can't believe that somebody's going to ultimately open up a new drawer and find a new book of the Bible or something like this. And if they did, you know, it would, I guess it would destroy some people's faith, but I, that's not where it is for me. Uh, and I, I really have a hard time believing that that, that is, a, is going to happen in the first place. But when those sort of things come across the, sh you know, the bow of the ship, some people get very concerned. And, and they get all nervous, and they start preaching and making evangelical Christians very nervous. And, it, and I see that as the devil's tool to keep us from doing what we ought to be doing about the world mission. We can just all fight each other and complain about other preachers. Yeah, question? Yeah, can I take a breath the Sure. Uh, question I wondered about, you haven't brought it up because you mainly uh, dealt with figures Church, but uh, what about uh, the tendency of Christian, I guess, I, at least I've read some, that in 81,000 they all gathered away for the second coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. And there's kind of a push among our society, you know, for the year 2000 and stuff like that. I just wondered, I mean, what you've read it, have there been other movements like that? Oh, yeah. Especially around the year 1000. Mm -hmm. uh, tell you what, uh, Cohn, uh, C O N N, has this. C-O-H-N, rather, Khan, has this wonderful book called The Millennium, which is a study of, uh, of apocalyptic movements in the history of the church. And uh, boy, if you think people are going to go bananas at 2,000, you should have seen what happened at 1,000. Because the millennium tradition is at least a biblical word. The two-millennium tradition isn't a biblical word. And uh, in fact, we all know that the Gregorian calendar is a problem that Jesus was really born in somewhere between 4 to 6 BC on our current calendar. So in a way, the millennium, if it's to take off on Jesus, would have to be what, what 2000, no, it'd have to be 195 or 194. 1994. It's hard to get really excited about 1994. <laughs> and, and the Chinese who operate on another calendar, they don't have that mystique at all, you see. I, I, I'm troubling, troubled by even in Lausanne and David Barrett and you know, getting all excited about, you know, we got a hundred plans now to save the world by the year 2000, 200 plans to save the world by the year 2000. And all I say is, 
it's not the first time we've been doing that. A thousand years ago, we were keeping score like that too, and uh, I think it's it's fun. You know, if that's your game, fine. I'd rather go to Cub games and, <laughs> and, and than play that one. But <laughs> I I don't know. I'm um, there's a lot of that going on. Yeah. There really is, and. Uh, I, I guess uh, apocalypticism is going to make some people uh, concerned. 1948, the forming of the Jewish nation did. I don't hear much talk about the common market ten toes theory now since there are 12 in the common market and probably it'll be 16 or 20 before the next decade's out. And, and so I get a little skeptical of the, the sort of this is that um, kind of thing. I live with the blessed hope as an imminent possibility. But I really don't feel a need to get into that millennial apocalypticism. Um, when we come back at two then, um, I'd like to take uh, that hour to work on the evangelical revival. As I want to say, Wesley basically is responding to this Puritanism on the one hand, and um, its underground nature and its, um, its problems. Uh, by the time of the 18th century, the 1700s, uh, Puritanism had run its course. The best of the Puritans had left England or been discredited by the overthrow and the glorious 1688 uh, restoration of the monarchy. Um, and uh, spiritual, spiritually, England was in the Dark Ages again. Um, empty churches, a little like Germany before pietism. And rationalism it wasn't solving anybody's problem. The economy was bad. Um, the great empire of Britain hadn't come yet. This is early 1700s. And so in that context, of course, there was a great deal of concern and John Wesley arose. And I'll try to talk about Wesley and the Methodist branch of evangelicalism and then shift over and talk about the Anglican versions of evangelicalism. And of course tomorrow we'll get into the American versions of that. Um, you just have to kind of block out of your mind the fact that the pilgrims are already in, on the continent now and, and we're going to continue to talk about Europe almost as though America doesn't exist yet, even though from here on out it does. But tomorrow we'll try to pick up and integrate that piece. Will all of you be here tomorrow? Some of you will not. It's been suggested she would like to take that camera and photograph everybody in this room. Why don't we do that this afternoon? And uh, she thinks it'd be kind of fun. She wishes we'd had a before and after picture uh, before you were enlightened, and you could we could we could measure the enlightenment in the aura of your faces. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, sometime this afternoon, we'll do that. I also, in the second hour this afternoon, would like to have you work into, into some small groups and um, share your map and do some of those things too. So we'll do that around some of these tables. We'll reconfigure, and maybe that's how we'll take the camera. We'll get into small groups and let you just walk around uh, and do that. Okay? See you. Two o'clock.